Good morning. morning. Scripture reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spend. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what we shall wear. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thank you, Phil. Great to see everyone this morning. What a good time of rejoicing. And uh, you guys sound great this morning. The singing's really good. So I appreciate that, being able to join in, and that's always a good thing, just to being able to participate in that. Um, Being anxious about life. That's the passage we're talking about today. I don't know if you've ever felt anxious about your life, about your clothes, about where things are going to come from. Uh, Sometimes we get into times like that. Uh, You don't have that when you're little. And the reason you don't have that when you're little is we think it'll always be there. It will always be provided. And somewhere along the line, we lose that. Now, we thought it would always be there because we know that person. They live in our house. They're going to take care of us. Food magically appears on the table somehow. There's always clean clothes that appear somewhere. And sometimes we have to inform our parents, I don't need your help. I'm going to do this myself. And that's kind of where we want to begin today because I think that's the attitude we get to when we start thinking about some of these things. I don't know if you've ever had the two-year-old. I'm sure if you've had a two-year-old, you've heard this. I do it myself. I put on my own socks. I do it, my, and it takes forever, doesn't it? I mean, you're, I could do this so much faster, but no, I do it myself. And then trying to teach him to tie shoes, wow. It's a good thing God invented Velcro. I mean, we would never get anywhere without that, you know, trying to teach them. You make the bunny ear, the bunny runs around, it goes through the hole, and you pull both. Yeah, they don't even have to learn that anymore. And so now they are just able to put on their own shoes, get the Velcro, and things are a little bit easier with that. But that attitude of, I do it myself, seems to be the attitude that we have. And we might need to go back to the time when we were kids that we assumed everything's just going to be there. We didn't worry about it. We knew the person who was going to take care of it. And don't we already know that today? And that's what Jesus' point here is, don't you know the person who's already going to take care of it? He talks about things that we can't add 
You can't add any more years to your life. You can't even add an hour to your life. You can't add any more hair on top. You, it turns gray. You can't add, well, you can't change, well, you can change the color, I guess. But you can't add a lot of things. You can't get any taller. I used to be tall. Uh, <laughs> The only time I'm tall is when I'm up here now, and everybody else has grown up around me, and especially kids. And, uh, you know, that's just the way things go sometimes. It's we can't change a whole lot of those things. And he gives you this passage, and as we look at this passage, he talks about some of the things that we can't add and that we can't change, and that those are things that God takes care of. He says, God takes care of lilies in the field. They look beautiful. There's nothing they did. Solomon, in all of the expensive clothes that he had and the gold that he had, would not be arrayed like one of them. And so God takes care of the lilies in the field. And they look beautiful when we're able to see them. The grass. And he talks here. But then the grass dies kind of quick, doesn't it? And then it gets thrown into the furnace, and yeah, I'm not sure I like that illustration. But he's going to take care of it. It's grass. That's what it's for. That's how long it's got. And maybe that's the point also. We only have so long, and that's all we've got. He says, so therefore, don't be anxious about what you're going to eat, about what you're going to wear, about what you're going to drink, God knows you need those things. The Gentiles are always seeking those things. But let God deal with those. I like the last line in, in 32. God knows that you need them all, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And notice what he says. All these things will be added to you. Do we really believe that. All these things will be added to you. That's the promise that he gives. He allows you to get clothes. He allows that we are going to be taken care of. And so God is going to take care of us. That's what that means. Now, we can't add any more years. We can't add any more hours. We can't add anything that makes us taller or shorter. But we can deal with some of the things. We can seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And that's what makes all the difference when we put the focus on God as being first. If we ignore his kingdom, then what do we expect? Is God going to take away everything from us? It doesn't say that. Uh, this is not one of those opposites. So don't put that in. No, he's not going to... Uh, come in and take away all your food and take away all your clothes. That's not what he's trying to say here, but he does say that you've got no promise then. It's up to you. You're on your own. Nobody's coming to take away what you can get on your own, but you have to get it on your own then. And so the promise is for, for those who put first his kingdom, God adds things. And it is a conditional thing. For those who put first his righteousness, God adds these things. And so we have to recognize that that's a way in which those things get added. Now we can have that attitude again that the two-year-old has. God, I do it myself. And he says, and I'll let you. And everything you get will completely be up to you. And everything you are unable to change will be completely up to you because there are some things you cannot get. We don't have to serve God, but wouldn't we choose to if God's going to add all these things to us? Wouldn't we make that as an assumption that this is the best way to do things? Well, did this ever happen before? Do we ever have any examples of how can we be sure that God is going to add these things to us? And fortunately, there's a whole lot of examples. And probably the biggest one we think about is with Solomon. 
Back in 1 Kings chapter 3, when Solomon is first taking the throne, he is the son of David. There is a huge mess in his family. If you have a mess in your family, just look at David and what's going on in his time, and wow, there's a whole lot of things that are a mess in his family. But finally, Solomon, the chosen one, after another king has been appointed, now is able to come to the throne, and God likes Solomon. He's had to go through all the shame of what happens with his family, that mom is looked down on, that his older brother has, has died already. And now here he is, and it's not exactly the best situation. But God appears to him in a dream and asks him, if I were to give you one wish, one request, what would you want? And here is Solomon's answer. He says, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern the, your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this great people? And it pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare to you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And we go, yeah, that's the one I wanted. That's a great one, isn't it? These things will be added to you. And so when you give the right answer back to God... When you're being the king and he asks, what do you want? And he says, I want to be able to govern well. I want to know right and wrong. I want to have the wisdom to be able to do this because it's just an overwhelming task that anybody would think that they could be king of a nation and not have difficulty with it. And so Solomon's answer is about the wisdom and understanding because this is an important task in being king over God's people. And God blesses him. God says, I will give you the wisdom you asked for, and then I will give you the things that you didn't ask for. And so what an incredible thing it is that Solomon finds himself in this situation of being blessed by God. He is one of those people that is looked up to. He is one of those people that has this place of power, and God gives him, adds things to him, that nobody else has, that no other king has. He is able to build the temple. It's something that didn't happen with his father, David. He is able to, in God's sight, say, I am able to build this temple, and he gathers everything together. David, his father, had gathered a lot of it together, but this thing is built, and it's almost done outside of this, and they come together, and they put it together without having to use tools. And what an incredible feat it is. The wisest king in all of history. The one who builds the great temple of God. He is also the richest king in all of history. Well, that's the one we wanted, right? We want that request. What's the one re thing that you can ask for? Of course, you always know the right answer is 10 more wishes. You know, that's the first thing you want is, let's keep this going, let me. But you realize you also have to live up to what you said. If you ask for wisdom to govern the people, then you better use the wisdom to govern the people well. Because that's what you ask for, that's what God's giving you for that purpose. So we need to see and understand that. It's not the fact that, well, I'm rich now. I'm powerful now. I am honored now. I can do all these things now. It's that, you know what? We needed this to serve God well. 
we need to serve God well. And so we think that that's the best answer. And any type of genuine answer, we have to live up to that answer. Well, Solomon is not the only one. There are a number of other people, and I'm just going to run through some stories. I hope all of these are familiar. If they're not familiar, please go back to the third grade Bible class, and you will get all of these stories. Uh, these are just ones you need to know. Moses is one of the great leaders in the Old Testament, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt and going toward a promised land. And as they get to the desert, they run out of water. And so they don't have any water to drink and they grumble against Moses. He strikes the rock and gives them water. And then they run out of food. And he prays to God and he gives them manna. Manna is something that comes up and is somehow on the ground in the morning. And it's manna. And they can boil it, they can bake it, they can, you can do, all, apparently it doesn't taste all that great. But it's food, and it is there every morning, and that is all that is there. They complain we don't have any meat. And so in the evening, quail will come nearby the camp, and you don't even have to hunt. You don't even get to hunt. The quail fly in, and then they fall, and all you got to do is go out and pick them up every single day. And you get enough for one day. That's it. You don't get all the manna you're going to need for the next two weeks. It's not building a cupboard so that you can store your pots of manna to make sure you've got enough. You get one day's worth of manna. If you try to collect more than one day's worth of manna, it spoils and it gets worms and it, yeah, don't do that. You have to follow exactly what it says. You have to follow the instructions that come with the manna. And so, yes, God feeds his people. Why are you anxious about what you shall eat? Don't you realize God already did this for 40 years with the people, giving them both manna and quail in the evening and the instructions of how to do it. But there are some things that go with this. You do need to follow the instructions. He does not give unlimited manna or quail. You do need to realize it is daily. They were at the point of starvation before anything is ever given. They do need to ask Moses. It does not just automatically appear. Moses does need to pray to God, and so there is prayer involved in this. Do not assume it is direct deposit and just shows up in your account. There are other things that are involved in this, in being able to have things added to you by God. And so there is this idea of need. There is this idea of request and ask of God and prayer to God. And yeah, all these things are added to you. There's none on Sabbath, by the way. You had to collect more the day before. And all of those things you need to know. And when you follow all of those things, you will be alive and it will be added to you that day. Elijah is another one. Elijah is one of the great prophets that we're able to see. He had a contest with Ahab, and Ahab is one of the ornery wicked kings. So in 1 Kings 17, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite the Tishbe, of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, therefore whom I stand, before whom I stand, therefore shall there... Okay, I can read this. <laughs> there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And you shall drink from the book, brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went, and he did according to the word of the Lord. He went, and he lived by the brook Cherith, which is on the east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought the, him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook, 
And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Well, Elijah, you prayed for there not to be any rain in the land, and so it's your own fault that the brook is drying up and there's nobody there. But another example of exactly what someone has been able to do, and God, because he believes in this and has essentially started this, all you don't really see it at the beginning, says, I will feed you there. I will give you what you need. God does provide. And so we can see the birds come and they give him food and he's got the brook there, except then the brook dries up. He's also got to be in hiding is the reason he's out by the brook. And so he does not just get the place where he's able to go and do anything he wants. Uh, you got to be willing to be fed by birds. Oh, not sure about that. How much can a bird carry? Well, you're going to be willing to be fed by whatever that bird brings, right? And you're going to be happy with it. And you're going to say, thank you, God, because you are taking care of me. Well, the brook dries up and he has no water again. And so he is sent from there to Zarephath. Zarephath is also under these starvation conditions, which is the conditions he has brought about because he prayed it wouldn't rain in order to turn wicked Ahab back to being a person of God. He is sent to a widow who has a son, and they are literally starving to death. She has enough oil and flour for one more meal. And after that, they die. She has one child, and Elijah comes and asks that she would give him that one cake. Actually, take that one piece of bread out of her dying child's mouth and give it to him first. That's really hard to do. That's hard to even think about. And she believes he's a prophet, and so she does. And the next morning, there is enough oil and flour for the next day. And the next morning, there is enough oil and flour for the next day. And the next, and the next. But only for one day at a time. And God provides and so we see story after story like this. There's another story of Joseph who is sold into Egypt, another very difficult family situation. Brothers don't usually like each other at different times, but it's hard to get away with selling one, you know, and, and it's just difficult to, you know, find any way out of that. But they actually pull it off and they're able to get rid of him before they kill him, which is a good thing. And so he is sent to Egypt actually under the plan of God to be able to basically save the world from starving to death. You remember about the seven good years where there's going to be great crops and the seven bad years where there's going to be a famine and nothing is going to grow for seven years. And he has the place of saving it first so that Egypt and everyone else around will have enough grain. Why didn't God just stop the famine? No. But he puts Joseph in the place, although there's a little prison time involved and a few other things, in the place of being able to rescue his people. And so he does save his people. God does not remove the drought. Joseph still had to do all the work. He still had to go through all of these things. They still had to grow all of the crops. He still has to store it all up. He still has to be over Egypt when it is being distributed. It is not like it just showed up in his bank account. It is a matter of this intense work that he has to do and his being involved in the process. What an incredible thing it is 
to realize that God is behind all of this. And so when God says, and it will be added to you, there may be a lot of the things that are involved in the adding it to you. But recognize God is behind it all. And God is in the process of it all. And I think that's what we need to be able to realize as we look at some of these fantastic stories. They are about that one thing that Jesus was teaching. It will be added to you. Well, to bring it down to a much smaller scale, we see Jesus as he feeds the 5,000 men. There's a time when they have been listening to Jesus for three days. They don't have any food. They've all run out except for one boy who has a lunch, five loaves, two fish. And he takes the last lunch from the last little boy and says, all right, now have everybody sit down. And now get them ready. And now come and I'll pass out food. And you have to actually go through the process of passing out the food to this 5,000 men, which probably have women and children with them. So this is looking more like between 10 and 20,000. And so it's a huge number of people. He's afraid that they would faint on the way. And so he says, well, let me just feed them. Well, first he asked his disciples to feed him. And he says, I can do this. And the people have to be patient. And the people have to wait for food. If you're number 10,000 and you're watching the guy at the front, well, he got food. (laughs) How how far back are they going to, you know, when are they going to run out? How big a basket is that? It's five loaves and two fish. How many fish has he used so far? How many loaves are still in that basket? And you're watching this whole thing come back. Is he even going to get to me? And we get anxious about it. And we're, you know, is it going to be added to me? I know he's done this for everybody else, but is it going to happen for me? And yeah, it is for all of them. In fact, then the next part is we got to pick up. Because there's all these broken pieces. Either there's really sloppy eaters... I don't know if you've thought about this. Do you pick up all the crumbs when you're at a picnic? Isn't that kind of the ant's job? You don't have to clean up everything because it'll be taken care of. There are birds that we are feeding that will come in and handle all of the scraps from this. But no, I think in order to make the point that you have way more than you ever started with, he comes in and he says, pick it all up. And they do. And there's 12 baskets picked up. And so it's a matter of saying, God is able to add to you when you have dedicated yourself to God. So there's a few things to learn from these examples. And I think in all of them, you can see they are involved in the work of God. That is a condition. That is important to realize. Moses is on a mission. He's trying to bring people to a new land. That's when it happens. Joseph is where God has sent him to save the people. That's where it happens. Elijah is bringing repentance to evil, uh, repentance to Israel, and it is because they are involved in these really serious endeavors from God that you can see God being able to add to them. Jesus, they're just skipping lunch and dinner for three days while they listen to him teach. Yeah, that's a big one for us too, right? If we had to come and say, well, we'll have lunch on Tuesday. You guys are staying, right? You know, that's maybe a little bit more than what we bargained for. These were not people who did nothing. There were things that they had to do. They didn't just show up. They participated in what God wanted. And so they were a part of the action that was going on. Many times they were part of the group. They had to be part 
of the nation of Israel. They had to be part of some group that was doing things. And so it was not a matter of God just provide for me apart from everybody else. Uh, no, it's God working with Israel, God working in those situations with the group. All of those things were added to people and they really didn't have to worry because they had bigger worries going on at the time. They weren't just sitting around thinking, you know what, everything's great except for lunch. We just don't have lunch. No, they were in a nation that was full of wickedness. They were in a time when there was starvation happening all around them. They were in a time when, yeah, there was a lot bigger worries happening and God provided, God takes care of us if we focus on him. Just after the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6 and verse 25, Jesus sees them. He's come across the Sea of Galilee and he comes to the other side and uh, they follow him and they're asking for lunch again. Don't you have more bread? Of course. It says, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you were seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give for you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And so after the feeding of the 5,000, they find him and it seems like they're just looking for lunch. And Jesus calls him on it. Yeah, he might call us on it and say, uh, really, what are you doing? And so he calls them on and says, I want you to work for the food that makes eternal things happen around you. Work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. The Son of Man will add to you. It's another one of those things that it will be added to you. When you work for eternal life, then, or when you work for the food that, that does not perish, and eternal life will be added to you. God has set his seal on Jesus. He sets his seal on us. It takes a man of faith to be able to accomplish this. The one who responds to God is given this eternal life. And eternal life is far beyond what you can get. How do you add eternal life to you? It's like trying to be an inch taller, isn't it? We can't really do it. How do you add eternal life to you? Well, it's not so difficult when you follow the instructions. The instructions are, look for the food that endures to eternal life. Follow the directions. It's all in here. It's not that difficult. We can figure this out. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's basically what he's saying. That's the whole thing. It comes all the way back around. We can't get there without that. And yet so many times we want to say, I do it myself. You leave me alone. I do it myself. And we end up with a whole lot less because we have insisted that we do it first. And so Jesus provides a way. Put first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. It means doing what God says. It means making sure that we are following those instructions that Jesus gives. Do you have a kingdom that you're supposed to rule over? Well, then don't try to be king. Let's just try to let Jesus be king, and we're not in the place of being king. And so we're going to follow what our king says and look at the things that our king does. In Romans 6, 23, he says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we recognize that's what is added to us, is eternal life. 
what we do, the wages of sin and the things that we get ourselves entangled in, deserves death. But Jesus has come and Jesus has died on a cross and Jesus has made a way for us to make a covenant with God by our repentance and by our baptism into Christ and then the Holy Spirit will be added to you, right? Isn't that the way the passage goes in Acts 2? These things will be added to you. So not only eternal life, but also Holy Spirit and redemption is added to you. Can you get your own redemption? I don't think so. Can you get adoption as sons on your own? Or does that come through Jesus Christ? And forgiveness is added to us. And grace is added to us. Can you no negotiate your own grace? God, I'll give you, you know, $5 for enough grace to save me. And mercy is added to us, and peace is added to us, and joy is added to us, and love is added to us, and the love of God being poured out into our hearts is added to us, and we are sealed with his Holy Spirit, and resurrection is added to us. I want to know how you're going to do that one when you get to the end of your life and say, well, only one more thing to buy, resurrection. You can't get there but it will be added to you if you just seek his kingdom and his righteousness. We understand this. And so this morning, what do you need to do so that God can add all these things to you? Because it seems like it's a package deal. All of it is added. All. Just put his kingdom and his righteousness first. And it isn't because God offers you a wish. It's because you surrender to Jesus. And I pray that you'll do that today. But don't be stubborn and say, I'll just do it myself. You're not going to get there. What do you need to do so that all of this is added to you? That's what we'd all like to see this morning. Shall we stand and sing?